uh, who was here in the previous talk that Robin did about building pipelines? Cool. Uh, there's some kind of overlap, but uh, there is a different approach here. So I'm talking about building, building pipelines with writing code. Uh, so it's a bit different. Um, so about me, um, I'm a lead consultant in a company here in London uh, that's called Open Credo. Um, we do, uh, we specialize in, in, in data. We specialize in, in data engineering and machine learning. We do a lot of uh, cloud architecture as well, as, as well and uh, DevOps and, and security. Um, so, um, we basically do hands-on, so we write a lot of code for different customers. Um, about myself, uh, I think I've been working with Kafka for four years, and that is uh, a lot of time, because uh, initial pipelines that we wrote in Kafka was basically using published subscriber, then we introduced the string APIs, then we changed back to things like KSQL and Kafka Connect. So the, there is a normal evolution in the things that we have done. Um, I have wrote some of the, some connectors, like the new 4 connector. In this talk, we are gonna look at the specific way that we build connectors. Uh, I guess it's really interesting for the people to understand how the connectors are built. I don't know how, how many of you are using Kafka now in production, so quite a few. How many of you are using strings? And connect? Cool. How many of you have wrote any connector? So we have quite, quite a few people that knows how to, how to write connectors, good. Um, so I'm gonna basically give you an example of um, well, can I go quickly for a little, a small introduction of ATL? Uh, because when, when we talk about connectors, when we talk about data connect for, for the people that are not as new in software as myself, we think about ATLs. Then a small introduction of what Kafka Connect is for the people that are not familiar, and then we are gonna start a journey of build a connector. So in this, this connector is, is of course uh, an example so we are not building a real connector, but it's actually a use case that we found quite, quite often in the clients that we work with. Um, so it's a, a stock exchange. So instead of talking about specific database details, what we are doing is talking about a specific HTTP interface that is a small REST service. Um, we're gonna talk about some important considerations and then we just grab up because um, I'm aware that is the last talk of the day, <laughs> and you get up early this morning. Um, probably you won't just go to you. You need to want to go to the path, right? After all these days, uh, so I know that I have a great responsibility of use my time properly and don't have a run in this talk. So, quickly going through the small introduction because, uh, as I say, when I when I talk with the people about Connect, everybody have in mind. Uh, ATLs. Um, so we we have living an, a, a, we are living in an interesting time where the things are changing quite quickly. Um, early in the early in the nineties, uh, there was uh, this requirement of, um, especially in, in retails, of running a specific queries for data analysis. There was the beginning of data analysis and the um, and business intelligence, as we know. Um, so most of the people start to copy some data from those operational uh, databases back to the uh, some, something that was mostly a columnar uh, column based database with different kind of compression with it build it within database so it can run uh, efficiently in a, this, in a denormalized mode um, then the basically the 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 amount of data that we that we saw in the in the in the market, the amount of data that comes from the internet, has been growing. And even if those uh, traditional warehouse uh, warehouse systems is still being every single day cheaper, so you can get nowadays a really cheap warehouse, well, really cheap comparing comparing with what it used to be. Um, the amount of data is still growing faster than it gets cheaper. From the other side, we, did, we, we live in a reality where we have different uh, 
different data source, right? So we start, we have in the past, most of, the, most of our data source in the past was relational data source. Now we have NoSQL, we have GraphDB. Uh, we have different realities into the, into the data source. And we see uh, real-time problems as well. Real-time problems means that now we have sensors, we have IoT, we need to get this uh, idea of, of this idea of, of getting the results faster, right? So traditionally, ATLs uh, was batch-based, so mostly batch operations that run flight to time, copying data. Now um, we do see that we need to get the things in real time. Um, and the traditional ATL was not, uh, was not really um, the most efficient way. They have some operational problems, right? First, the idea of having a, a schema that fits all the, kind, all the set of data, um, then the operational complexity of running those ATLs overnight. Another interesting pattern that we see uh, as a consultant I see quite often, and especially after coming to the summit, I see that more, of, more people is talking about is the idea of uh, the events as a source of truth. Um, when we build new uh, applications nowadays, we actually build microservices most of the times. Uh, and the microservices have a clear characteristic, the characteristic of having different data source or different source of truth. So our source of truth in the company is no longer unique. It's now distributed across a set of different microservices. And there is an evolution in this pattern that we see is that the people first, well, previously the this, uh, this different, uh, these different microservices might communicate between each other by events, things that have happened and needed to propagate events. Um, the normal uh, evolution of this, of, of this kind of communication is that we segregate it with uh, maybe a streaming platform, uh, a distributed log that help us to basically <laughs> segregate or decoupling the published and subscribers. At the same time, it evolves to a, to a central streaming platform that communicates different applications and different microservices, making, making the platform a huge asset for uh, our IT architecture, basically making, able, making the architecture to be forward comp data comp compatible. So we now focus on architectures that are forward compatible in terms of data. It supports something that we talk about, well, many companies, the keynotes talk about it, that is uh, application state reconstruction. And application state reconstruction, even if it's seven sourcing or a chain log, is a really interesting concept and a powerful concept to, to have in your IT organization. And at the same time, uh, allow us experimentation, right? So if we have the ability to reveal our system, if we can reveal the state of our application, then we can experiment with this, with this state. Um, so this uh, change into the uh, landscape have created a gap, a technology gap that it needs to be fit. And this is the, what Kafka Connect tried to, tried to fit, uh, at least uh, well, in my opinion. So Kafka Connect is, uh, it comes with the framework, with, with, the, with the Kafka ecosystem. The main purpose of Kafka Connect is copy data from Kafka and to an external system, and from this external system back to Kafka. That, is probably something that you are familiar. It is distributed and scalable. Uh, at the same time, um, one of the main components that we have in Kafka Connect is the connector, and the connector is reusable, so we probably don't need to write any code. Um, two different kind of connectors that uh, I think we already talked about in, a previous, in the previous talk is the source connector. The source connector has the responsibility of taking data from a specific data source and publish this into the framework in the form of records. And the sync connector will take a bunch of records and then write those records back to the, uh, back to the system, back to the uh, different data store or the same data store. Um, if we add the rest of the family here, we have the concept of the of, of introducing transformation, the same concept that was already mentioned, is the fact that we are still having our published and subscribers. We have published and subscribers that can basically read the data that we are ingesting, or publish new data back into the topic, and then we have Kafka strings. Kafka strings as an, as an element of, of transformation. It allows, to, it allows us to take the data from 
from the different applications or from the different uh, data source and transform it instead of just basically doing data cleansing. So we have a powerful uh, tool to do in transformation. As, as we saw in many talks with, intro, with the introduction of KSQL, the simplification of the language that we use to transform this data is much better now. So back to the same concept, we now have again an ATL an ATL that allows destruction, the load and the transformation, but it's no longer a tool as it used to be in the 90s. Now it's a platform. Um, it is distributed in the sense that it, it comes with a, all the components in this platform are distributed. Therefore, they are fault tolerant and at the same time are data centric. So we don't have this concept of a massive uh, a schema that is uh, in the data warehouse. Um, before, well, before going into the details into the code that we are going to build, uh, we need to talk about the different modes, standalone and distributed mode. Um, so for the guys, the guys that was basically running uh, Kafka Connect, who runs Kafka Connect in standalone and distributed? So few, few of you already run distributed Kafka Connect. The idea is simple. The idea of the distribution is, is it's okay to have Kafka Connect in a standalone, especially if you are running, for instance, containers. You can deploy uh, individual Kafka Connect with a specific task. You can have as well a distributed cluster that allows you to basically scale as well as uh, have fault tolerant. The idea, of the, the idea of the distributed mode is that the task can be split across different workers. And as well, if there is a worker that is failing, you have, uh, you have a rebalance. You can actually get this task moved to a different or a live, a live worker. So to implement any connector, we need only two interface, two concepts that we have to introduce. One is the connector. The connector has the responsibility. Well, we talk about the connector as a source or a sync connector. It has the responsibility of breaking the task and drive the configuration of the, of the task as well. It's a, as a common component, it's something that we use to monitor the, the status of uh, the data system that we try to that we try to integrate. So normally we can have like a monitoring task to understand if the database, for instance, or the data store is in a live is in a live mode. Um, and then we have the task, and the task is basically the host power. It's the component that knows how to talk with the external system. Um, So, of course, because of the different responsibilities between source and sync, we will expect different interface when we have to implement connectors. So, our, our um, source connector will have this pool operation. The pool operation will of, course, will, of course, return a set of records, as well as other auxiliary methods that we can use, uh, like the commit method that we can take, that we can, that we can implement and hook. Um, the sync is exactly the opposite. We will have um, a put operation. The put operation will receive from the firmware a bunch of records of, in that case, um, sync records. And the responsibility of this method will be to place those into the external system as well as, uh, as, well as the flash operation. The flash operation is mostly a synchronous way to clean up what the, what the task is doing. Um, so, as I say, this is a journey, and in order to make this, conf this talk a little bit more concrete, we need to introduce an example. Um, so our, our user case, as I introduced, is a simple user case where we have um, order service, and we work for a trading company. So in this trading company, uh, we receive orders of um, basically buy or sell a specific stock price. Um, so we place those orders back into Kafka from one specific, from the other microservice to Kafka, and then the order decision will take the decision if it executes the order or it, it doesn't. So the requirement that we have is at some point this, this order event that we have, we need to enrich this event. So the order decision can take a, can take a, can, can basically be informed. So enrichment is one of the common use cases. Uh, so we have basic event that is sell just buy this stock. This is the price that I want to buy, and this is the variance that I basically will admit. Um, and we have uh, one source 
and the source in that case is an external service, something that we, we can think about this external service of a stock price service as uh, um, Google Finance or Yahoo Finance, right? An API that allows us to query a specific uh, uh, a stock price in, in the moment, at the moment, right? So um, when, when we work in consultants, we always do something that is, okay, let's, let's start with a naive approach. What is the, first, the faster way to build something, even if it's stupid? Because it helps you to clarify what will be the what will be the, the, the redefining of the approach. So starting with the naive approach, we can create a specialized uh, service to do this enrichment. So we divide the topic, so we create two specific particular topics, one from the, from the, from the order price and the other for the enricher, and then we create a small service that is in a consumer and a producer that read the data from the, the read the orders, then it contacts this uh, third party resource because it knows the interface, and then republish the event back to the topic with a uh, enriched data, in that case the reference price of the reference value. Um, so so far it's, 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 it's good, it's actually working, and it's a, it's a working solution, but we have a few problems with the solution. The first problem is that, of course, it's wasteful, right? We need to, for each, in a streaming solution, try to contact a third party for every single event. It seems not the right thing. Um, that introduced a discussion. Can we do cash? Yes, of course we can do cash. We will not, it's not critical. There is a variance, there is a control, so we can introduce some caching, at least in this, in this uh, example. And the second thing is that, well, the knowledge of how to contact this external system, how to extract data from this external system, it's uh, built into a component that should be only doing transformation, right? It's an enricher. So we probably want to expose this data back to different things. Maybe another team needs to do something similar and enrich this information with other, other kind of, uh, of events or maybe they just want to publish this in our, in our website. So we revisit the approach, and what we do is basically, well, let's use the, the framework. What are the capabilities on the technology that we use, that are Kafka, right? So we can use Kafka Connect, of course, for destruction. So we introduce a new component that is the, connect, um, the connector, so that is a connector source that will know how to talk with this specific uh, well-known API. And then we change the enrichment, the enricher for a transformation. And our transformation is mostly the, our source will publish the price, we have an event, so the only thing that we need to do is basically aggregate the updates that we have from the source and then perform a single join. And we can do with uh, Kafka streams or we can do that with case, case equal. Um, we, at the end, we will end having exactly the same, but two clear responsibilities segregated. Um, so now, is the, now the question is how we get, which connector do we use, right? So the, for the people that are not familiar with Connect, one, the first thing to do is actually, we mentioned that it's a reusable component, so probably we need to go to the web page, the Confluent web page, uh, that have a set of uh, connectors that are existing. Not all of the connectors that are in the community are in the web page, but the majority of them are. Uh, it classifies the connectors into three different categories, one being the Confluent connectors, connectors that are developed by Confluent, other connectors that are certified. Certified connectors are mostly um, service integrator integrators that go to a certification process, so the code is validated, and then we have open source or community connectors. Uh, my recommendation is as per, per any other open source uh, solution that you use in your, in your architecture, you have to do the, your, your typical due diligence. Um, so after the scanning this web page, we detect that there is a connector that may fit, that's the red connector, and it's good to explore it. We can actually check it. Is that connector is that connector good for us? And probably it is. Um, for our example, because this is a well-known um, third-party API, we want to do something a little bit uh, further with the connector. So the REST connector is quite transparent. We want to introduce schemas. We want to do something more fancy with the API of the connector. So we decide to build our own connector. So we start the journey of building a connector. So um, 
who of you here write Java code? Or any JVM code? So, JVM language <laughs> code? Well, um, I've been writing Java for, for, for I don't know, 15, 15 years, and of course I have used the, the Java API. The reason for using the Java API is that it is the API that where connectors are built, so it's more transparent and clear to, to write the code in Java. Um, so starting for the source connector, uh, we just basically need to define two interfaces, the source, the source connector and the task connector. So we can extend the source connector, we get the set of methods that we want to, that we want to run, uh, one of the main methods that I, I always look is at the configuration is where I start. The reason why I, use the, I start with the configuration is that I want to know what is the interface of my connector. I want to know which kind of parameters do I need to request and I want to document those, those parameters. Uh, the config, the config definition of this small object that the, the method return is where you place the configuration of your connector. So for our example, we need to have uh, three parameters. One parameter is the URL of the service. This third party service might be a well known URL, but the URL will, might change, so we introduce the, the URL as a parameter. The second parameter is how, how often do I pull this resource, right? Because we can, we can hammer this uh, third party resource, but we don't, we don't need those fre frequent updates, so we might want to introduce a set of milliseconds of how often do I query this, uh, this resource. And the third parameter that I introduce is the, the topic. In which topic do I need to publish this? Um, this configuration object is not only for basically defining which configuration do I need, it's as well a good place to document the configuration. Uh, if you use the if you use the Confluent uh, control center that is privative and I have used it in different clients, um, you can get even a small UI to configure those connectors. Um, so our configuration will look something like that. We have um, our resource and probably the naming is not the best one. The class that we are implementing, the connector class, the number of tasks that we are using, and I'm starting only with a single task for this connector, the URL of the service, that was the parameter that I have defined, as well as the uh, interval and the, uh, and the topic where to publish. So the next step is, of course, um, we might, for instance, for the URL, right? So we define the types of the parameters. We can use two things. One is the validators and the other are the recommenders. Um, both are solutions to verify that the configuration and give as much feedback as possible to the user that the configuration is correct. So it's good to actually implement those. There are already a set of, of, of them pre-built, like range, if you are talking about a numeric value, but um, I will strongly recommend you to, to, to look at those connectors. And of course, uh, you need to use the false, for instance, to make your, your, the interface of the connector, especially if you are going to distribute it uh, forward, backward compatible. Um, so we, we build, a, we build a, the, the source, the configuration, the definition. We need to get the lifecycle methods, start and stop, if we have to start any kind of resource. We need to place the configuration from the connector back to the task. That's something that we have mentioned. Um, and then we have the, ta the task class, and this is which class do, we, do I use to run the job, and this class will have a specific life cycle, so we can go and extend this task. When we extend this class, we just basically have the life cycle methods as well as the pool operation. The pool operation is the one that we use in order to build our, our code, right? So we have the responsibility of pulling from an HTTP request. Uh, so we start, to build the, we start to build our code, we control the intervals of the execution, and we return a, we return a specific um, source record. So far, what I'm doing is returning the full body of the HTTP request as it is. I'm not doing any kind of processing or schema. We will come back to this later, but what we have so far is we quickly build a connector. We already have an existing connector that will pull from, from this external HTTP resource and republish back to, back to Kafka. Um, so we have a fully built resource, we have defined the interface, we are ready to deploy the, 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 this object. Um, but we need to start to thinking some of the concerns 
that we have when we build connectors. So the first concern is, of course, well, I might have more than one URL. So imagine this stock price sample. The stock price sample, when we query a specific URL, we might have the stock listing for a specific market. But there are more than one markets ab available. So it might be some specific use case where we need to query for more, one of more, one of two or three markets. So the URL that we have changed a little bit. Now we have a small uh, pad where we have a list of markets. Uh, there are multiple options to solve this problem. Other option is basically deploy a new connector because we already have one that is fully functional. We can basically deploy another instance and we get different market. Probably we don't want to do that because then we need to monitor more than one, um, more than one connectors and that is just nasty. If there are 10, then we need to monitor 10 connectors. So we need to adapt our connector to um, work around among multiple tasks. Um, so we introduced a small change in the configuration now. So we need a new parameter, and the parameter is basically our markets. Um, we're doing something interesting as well. We are increasing the number of tasks, right? So it's not a data intensive uh, operation, what we are doing here. But we might want to distribute this across multiple tasks. So what we do is um, basically change the number of, of the max tags in the configuration, and we can now work in the how we we can now work in a method that we already know is a well no is the task config. We saw that into the connector interface. Um, this uh, will read the set of markets, and the the main responsibility of this task is distribute those different URLs, those different markets, back to the tasks that are available, right? So we use the functionality that is already built into the group partition, that is the group partitions. That's already pre-built into the utils of the framework. So the only thing that we need to do is compute uh, the possible, the, how we distribute those small, UR, these small markets back to the container. So when we run it, we are having now, when we deploy this, we have now two different, two different tasks. Every of the tasks will receive a set of markets because in our initial configuration, we only have three markets. We will see that one task is running one and the other two tasks are running the three. If some of the tasks change, if, if we reconfigure the container, if, uh, sorry, the connector, if, um, if we change the if we change the, the number, the reconfiguration will trigger and then it will split this into different tasks. Um, so that is for that is an example of this is an example of a, of a source connector. The sync connector is a bit more transparent because we have a set of partitions and those set of partitions need to be mapped into a set of tasks. So a task being um, will take part of the partitions. Um, another important requirement of when we think about it is that we always query the same data. We iteratively query the same data over and over. The body of the listing can be high, or can be quite large. Um, so after talking with our external party or after investigating the API, we have, a, we have a parameter in the API that is the timestamp. And the timestamp is no more than give me the updates <coughs> from a specific point in time, right? So this is about offset manager, how we manage the offset into the, into the specific connector. So for managing the offset, we have two options. Basically, we can use the framework to manage the offset or we can uh, use the external system to keep track of the option. And that's a design decision. There is design de in this design decision, because it's a simple example and we don't have um, <laughs> time, we can probably use the, use the, the, the offset that is uh, the offset management that is built within the framework. So in case of a standalone, it will be a file in, if we don't change the configuration. In case of uh, a distributed uh, connect, implementation, then it will be a compacted topic centralized so it can be accessed from the different tasks and the different workers. So we use the source partitions and the offset partition when we return the parameters and the framework then will take the responsibility of persist the offset. Um, those, even if the code here is a bit convoluted, it's basically because of the maps. So we have different uh, uh, complex object to represent both things, to represent the 
um, the key of my offset, for instance, this is uh, in the case of a database, which database and which table, and as well the offset, which column on the, sorry, which row ID into the database. Uh, when we recover the, when we schedule the task, when the task got basically, uh, when, when we change the number of tasks, we then need to recover the offset back. We recover the offset back using the offset vector reader that is part of the connector. So the, the framework allow us, base, allow us both things, persist the object and recover back the, op, the offset. So during the reconfiguration of a task, during the start and stop life cycle, we can do things like read what is the offset, the specific offset, and then use it within the connector to basically know where we, are, where we was. Well, Another important thing that I didn't mention, of course, for us, our offset is the last execution. When is the last time that I successfully get the, um, get the, the data? So I'm gonna go quickly through um, three uh, considerations. One is the data schema. We mentioned, or I think someone mentioned before in, another, in other talks that the Kafka Connect offers a specific API for the schemas. We definitely need to use it when we are building source connector. We basically uh, use a couple of features from the framework, one being the schema and the other is the struct, the schema being the representation of the metadata and the struct, the, the, the object. So for our stock price, we can use the schema builder, build um, basically a representation or a schema for our data being the market and the stock strings and the price of course. Working in finance, I'm not gonna use a floating, so I need to use a decimal implementation and the object. So now we can uh, stop to send single uh, bytes from the HTTP and then map it to a specific schema and a specific uh, data structure. Um, so this is, inter the data lining is interesting, the ability to recover the schema. It can be quite tricky sometimes. We always need to go to the source, so if it's a database, we need to check the metadata of our tables. If it's a file, we need to try to discover which is the format of the file, and then align it to the internal, uh, to the internal um, data representation. And of course, because different databases have different numeric types, uh, you, you have to do your mappings. You actually need to implement your own mappings. Um, the other interesting concept that we have is the, is the message delivery. Uh, and that's an important question, so especially when you work in consultant, you go, you go to your client, you propose a solution, and the first thing that you are asked, what's, my, my, what's the message delivery? So uh, I just give you here a small, uh, small uh, introduction. So the source connectors are normally at least once. Uh, for our example, because we are always pulling the same information, we are persisting the information back into a stream, we don't really care if it's at least one, if that makes sense, because the data will be overwritten, so it will be then potent. Um, in, our, in the sync connectors, there are many sync connectors available, and it's the beauty of, of those connectors that are exactly ones. The way that you implement exactly once most of the time is basically you persist your offset with the data when you're writing that into the target system using a, a, the transactional capabilities of the target system. Um, and then when you look at those connectors and there are source connectors, sorry, sync connectors that are not exactly ones, they might be idempotent. So idempotency is another property that most of the connectors at the end end implementing. And the other thing is of course, um, because I'm running quite short of time, is the converters. So um, the converters are, allow us to change the data, the data format. So we talk about this internal schema. We don't have this internal schema representation back to Kafka. So when we are writing a source, uh, we can change this data schema or use internal uh, data representation that we want. If you want to use Abro, we, we use the Abro converted, so other applications can use the Abro server if this is the case of, or the Abro serialized, if uh, we are talking about um, a specific, um, a specific um, well, if the company decide to use Abro on top instead of JSON, but that's of course, uh, their own preference. And one of the beauties of the Abra converting and the integration with the, is this integration with the schema registry. So it's one of, uh, it's one of my technology choice most of the times. So what I haven't 
covered yet in that presentation is a few things that are really important in the framework, but I think they fall from the presentation because of the, because of the time. One being the single message transformer that allowed basically doing data cleansing, single transformation, and I think Robin covered uh, there in the previous talk pretty well. The other is testing, how you test that. So testing can be an, an interesting challenge when you build uh, connectors. So most of the time you end doing a lot of unit testing because the dependencies that you have are really difficult to mock. Other times, as for instance, for the case of the new 4J connector, because you can run an embedded version of it, it can be uh, much simple. The packaging system and the uh, plug -all components, as well as an error, well, are, are interesting concepts. So if you have any kind of question about testing or packaging, just give me a shot, and we, I will be here after, after the talk. Uh, error handling is basically the same philosophy of there are errors that are recoverable, there are errors that are not recoverable. Uh, so you have the same capabilities within the, within the framework, dynamic top partitions and, and change data capture. Chain data capture is an interesting concept that was introduced before, the idea of reading, reading data, changing data into the specific source, and they have a quite a specific uh, interface at the end. So just to summarize, um, Kafka Connect addressed the, a gap into the connecting of those data systems and it solved most of the problem that previous uh, technologies that um, I used Flume in the past used to have. At the same time, the framework is, is something that you can use without the requirement of build your own connectors or write any kind of code, but I will strongly recommend that if, because in every single enterprise there will be a use case like this, there is a specific interface that someone has built that is HTTP or maybe it's a SOAP interface, so it can be a perfect place to uh, perform an integration with this, interf with this, uh, with this interface. Uh, we only need to care about the iteration when we use Connect. We don't really care about the, the internal producer details. We uh, strongly recommend to look at it because you will boost your performance, but you mostly need to know how to talk with the technology that you are integrating. Um, the framework will take part of the heavy lifting, so it will do all this offset management, and especially in a distributed environment where you need to get this, uh, this distributed, as well as um, it, the ability to perform the strong and good uh, configuration definitions. Um, most, of the, most of the implementation decisions uh, are based on the, on the target system. So there is no good and bad, or there is no, there is no specific, that those are the best practice that I will recommend you, because at the end it depends a lot on the target system that you are trying to implement. And of course, one conversation that you need to start is basically the delivery guarantees and where to store the offset. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have two minutes for questions. Yeah, we have some time for questions. We have a mic that we can pass around. Yeah, hello. Yeah, so for the use case uh, when you have SIM connector and, for example, you have some state store state data. And uh, when you start it, you have a lot of state data. There is a kind of change log. And you want to, on the first step, you want to synchronize the current presentation of the state store. So basically, you materialize it to some state store, uh, push the data to the external system. And after that, you want to start, only after that, you want to start, start streaming the actual, so the connector, it is actual, actually the, connector is split into two phases. One uh, phase like uh, it is uh, synchronized, let's say, replication of the current state, and after that it turns into streaming mode. Uh, because this, for us it is real case. For example, we are streaming data to the Prisma backend, and uh, it is quite slow. So and we have, for example, for our states, well, we have like hundred and uh, even thousands of data for the same state, so we don't want to, we want just to push the latest state to hmm. the, to the backend and after that stream the, the So, um, yeah. I, I don't know if I um, understood the question uh, entirely because uh, mm -hmm. I think you are, you have something really specific in mind. Uh, it is not specific, it is when you have state store, yes, yes. You have, we have a topic that represents your yeah. state. 
database table. Okay. And so uh, you, when you uh, synchronize it to external system, to the database, you okay. don't want to replicate the whole history. You just want to start the, from the current point, and after that you want to stream uh, as new data comes in. Okay, so I guess the, 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 the internal case store, right? The internal store that you have in Kafka mm -hmm. is that uh, with case things? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what you can always do is basically stream this data out with the with the stream framework, for instance. Yeah, but it is we we cannot use connect in this case. So we just what we are doing, we are writing the yeah. streams application. You can use a streams application to to send it to a stream uh, to a specific topic, and then okay. a stream from this topic, for instance. Otherwise, and you what you need to do is uh, query your internal data store. And for querying the, your internal data store, I, I only think about things like uh, iterative queries that help you to query that. But of course, there's a lot of code that you need to do in top of the applications. When mostly what you want to do is use case strings to send the data out and then use Kafka Connect for the integration, right? OK, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? I think everybody want to go home. So. Thanks for the talk. It was Thank very, very insightful. Uh,